Welcome to today's webcast from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality on the new ARC-SOPS Diagnostic Safety Supplemental Items for Medical Offices. My name is Joanne Sora. I'm an Associate Director at Westat and the Project Director for the contract that supports ARC-SOPS surveys, and I'll be the moderator for today's webcast. Uh, before we begin, I have a few housekeeping details. If you're having difficulty hearing the audio from your computer speakers, you can change the audio selection so that WebEx can call you back and connect through your phone instead. If your computer freezes during the presentation, you can try logging out and logging back into the webcast to refresh, refresh the page. Um, and remember though, that you may just be experiencing a lag due to your internet connection speed. And if you need help at any time during this webcast, use the Q&A icon that I'll show you on the next slide. So at any point throughout today's presentation, you may ask a question through the Q&A feature shown here. Depending on the browser you're using, your WebEx screen may look a little bit different from this slide, but you're gonna look for the Q&A icon at the bottom right-hand side of your screen and be sure that the drop-down option displays all panelists for you to ask your question so the team can see it. We encourage you to share your name and or organization or role when you type your question. Today's session is being recorded and a replay of today's webcast and the slides will be made available on the ARCSOPS website. So now that we have the housekeeping items out of the way, I'm happy to introduce today's speakers. We're very pleased to welcome Karen Ginsberg, who directs ARC's programs on the Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems, or CAPS, and the Surveys on Patient Safety Culture, or SOPS. An anthropologist and demographer, Dr. Ginsberg has broad-based experience in patient experience, patient safety, and public health. In her position at ARC, she focuses on program development, implementation, operations, and evaluation, with specialty in survey design and development and qualitative evaluation and assessment. Previously, she held positions at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Westat, and the National Quality Forum. I'm also pleased to introduce Dr. Gordon Schiff. Dr. Schiff is a general internist and associate director of Brigham and Women's Center for Patient Safety Research and Practice, safety director of the Harvard Center for Primary Care, and associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He was the PI for the ARC Developmental Center for Patient Safety Research Project, focusing on diagnostic errors. He was an invited expert and reviewer for the 2015 National Academy of Medicine report, Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare. In 2019, he received the Mark L. Graber Diagnostic Quality Award from the Society to Improve Diagno Diagnosis in Medicine, and also was awarded the John M. Eisenberg Patient Safety and Quality Award for Individual Achievement from the Joint Commission and the National Quality Forum. Finally, I'm happy to introduce my colleague, Naomi Yant, a Westat Senior Study Director and Industrial Organizational Psychologist with more than 15 years of experience in organizational research and analysis. Dr. Yant has worked extensively in analyzing and exploring data from the surveys on patient safety culture. She also worked on updating the hospital survey on patient safety culture to create version 2.0, and worked on the development of several SOPS supplemental item sets. Here's our agenda for today's webcast. We'll start with Dr. Karen Ginsberg giving a brief overview from ARC, and then Gordy Schiff will provide background on diagnostic safety. Dr. Naomi Yant will provide an overview of the SOPS diagnostic safety supplemental items. Lastly, we've reserved time for Q&A at the end, so let's begin, and I'll hand it off to Karen. Karen? Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and uh, I, I'm happy to uh, welcome you to today's webcast and present this new supplemental item set for our medical office uh, survey on uh, patient safety culture. So before we begin, let me give you a little bit of an overview about the uh, SOPS program and uh, the SOPS surveys. The, um, the SOPS program was initiated and funded by ARC uh, since 2001, and it's a program to advance uh, the understanding and measurement and improvement of patient safety culture within um, healthcare settings. 
Uh, we develop validated patient safety culture survey instruments using the best methods for development and testing. And uh, in addition to the surveys, we also uh, conduct research for further understanding of patient safety culture, including how to measure it and, improvement and improve it. We also support uh, databases for our surveys. Uh, databases um, contain uh, data that you choose to submit after you uh, conduct your SOC survey. And, and if you choose to submit data, we'll give you a customized report back and uh, you'll be part of the uh, de-identified database for research. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how we define patient safety culture. Um, we define patient safety culture as the beliefs and values and norms that are shared by healthcare providers and staff in an organization. Uh, we say that patient safety culture determines the behaviors in that organization that are rewarded, supported, expected, and accepted as they relate to patient safety. And we also say that it's important to note that, that different uh, uh, units in an organization uh, or departments or, or even at the system level can all have their own patient safety culture. Next slide, please. So the SOPS uh, surveys are surveys of providers and staff about the extent to which their organizational culture supports patient safety. Um, you can see we, we uh, released our first survey of hospitals in 2004, and you can see the other surveys that we've released since then, nursing home, medical office, community pharmacy, and our newest is uh, for ambulatory surgery centers. And the next slide, please. And so while the surveys are all customized for, for the different settings, they basically all, you know, contain questions measuring these domains of interest, teamwork, communication openness, communication about error, organizational learning and continuous improvement, response to error, staffing, supervisor or manager support for patient safety, work pressure and pace, and we have an overall rating on patient safety. And the next slide, please. So here's how you can use a SOP survey. You can use it to raise awareness about patient safety uh, in, um, among your staff. You can um, use it to assess the culture of your organization to identify strengths and areas for improvement. If you administer it more than once, you can examine trends over time, or you can evaluate the impact of um, your patient safety initiatives. And then my last slide, please. So let me just position today's talk for you. Um, we're, uh, we have core surveys, and you can see them down the left side of this slide, and then we have supplemental item sets that you can use to customize the course survey. So today we're talking about the diagnostic safety item set that it is, was tested to be administered with the medical office stop survey. We also have another medical office supplemental item set on value and efficiency, and then another version of that for the hospital survey, uh, as well as uh, uh, an item set for hospitals on health information technology. And um, here's a preview of coming events. We hope to release a workforce safety item set for the hospital setting this fall. So um, I think many of you today are from hospitals, so please uh, uh, subscribe to our listserv. We'll tell you how to do that in a little bit, and you can receive announcements about when it's released and, and the webcast that we'll hold to introduce it. So uh, thank you again for joining us, and with that, I'm going to turn this to Gordy. Gordy? Hi, everybody. Okay. Um... Uh, so, in a very brief few moments, I'm basically going to orient you all just about the importance and a little bit of background related to diagnostic safety and the importance of diagnostic errors. Um, I think a nice starting point is, is really just uh, two decades ago. This is a, a report on uh, ARC, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality's activity in patient safety research, and it really reported on a series of grants which were uh, nearly 100 in number that were awarded. And it turns out only one focused on diagnostic errors. This is the developmental center that was just mentioned. And I think it turns out that we were only, the only ones foolish enough to wade out into the swamp of diagnostic errors. We, 
we met every Friday, we, we presented cases, we tried to understand what, what was the error, what was the cause of the error. The only clear headed people that helped us think this through were the non MDs in the room. And uh, uh, we were uh, uh, feeling both uh, uh, frustrated that we were carving a new path through a wilderness and sort of excited realizing that we were finding important things. Uh, so, such that uh, over the next 15 years, um, this area that, uh, as Bob Wachter said, didn't get much respect in patient safety really was elevated with the uh, publication of the Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare. This is what called the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Medicine Report on Diagnostic Errors. And if people haven't read the uh, executive summary, it's about 15 pages. I think that would be a good starting point to reorient you, remind you, and, uh, and uh, of, of course, we can talk about some of the things that have been done to further uh, implement these recommendations, the eight recommendations that they had. Um, but the thing that I just mainly want to emphasize is that diagnostic errors are frequent, important, overlooked matter, and really for the purposes of us today, not easy to measure, but we're, we're going to try and we're going to uh, uh, show you the fruits of the labor of the committee of us that met for several months really, and then they were tested and further revised with, uh, um, with, with the experts in patient safety and diagnostic errors. And maybe they'll list who those are in the future ones. So um, let me just mention why we really are keen in talking about diagnostic errors today. Um, patient reports, um, uh, if, if you, as you'll see, patients report this as the number one type of errors, looking at malpractice claims, particularly in the ambulatory setting, and then safety experts uh, consider this to be important. So this is a, a survey that was done um, in the state of Massachusetts, uh, uh, but from the Betsy Lehman Center, who we we're working with actually on a project called PRIDE. People want to hear more information about that, feel free to write me, but we're trying to collect cases and learn from cases. And, uh, but this is a random sample where they asked people, have you experienced an error or someone coached you? And roughly 25%, one in four. But this is the interesting and actually, frankly, even surprising thing. The leading type of error reported by Massachusetts residents was you or your medical, or someone's medical problem was misdiagnosed more than wrong test, surgery, or treatment put together, unclear instructions, et cetera, um, and hospital infection. So by a, by a big majority, the uh, number one problem was misdiagnosis. This was another survey done by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI, and National Patient Safety Foundation. And here they broadened their question, have you or anyone you know uh, experienced a medical error? And there, here we're up to almost 50%, 41% had experienced a medical error uh, or knew someone or, or even both. And uh, again, when they broke down what type of error was experienced, misdiagnosis was here, 59 uh, said misdiagnosis. And even if you look at number three here, the diagnosis didn't make sense. So again, diagnosis is just screaming out loudly for us to try to be addressing this. And uh, even if you look at malpractice claims, a couple of other piece of data. Um, surgical, sur and this is one from Covirus, surgery or procedure related um, and diagnosis related are sort of neck and neck here. But if you look at the percent that have an indemnity paid, and in very simple terms, this means when they really looked into this allegation of malpractice, they found something was really wrong and really could be improved. And uh, so diagnosis is much higher percentage of uh, allegations either settled or won by the plaintiff. And what that really is telling me that there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. And I think the purpose of this new instrument is to shine some light on those opportunities and try to drive that improvement. Um, and then finally, this is the data that we collected as part of another actually ARC funded project on malpractice and patient safety. And this is in primary care. We looked at all the primary care claims um, we got Crico and Covaris, the two insurers in Massachusetts, to the competitors to share all their cases, the closed claims. And here, if we just look in the ambulatory primary care setting, uh, there's roughly over a five-year period, 100 malpractice cases 
uh, closed claims a year, 500 over a five year period, and 400 out of 500. Uh, you can see again, and this isn't just edging out medication related, but by a factor of really six or seven to one uh, diagnosis related. Um, and then ECRI, many of you are familiar with ECRI, it's a quality and safety organization in Pennsylvania. Here they, they polled the people who are the experts working in the area, people on the front lines, uh, quality and risk departments across the country, 2018, number one diagnostic errors, all these other problems, obviously important, opioid safety, uh, IT issues. Um, and then 2019, diagnostic stewardship and test result management in the HRs were uh, number one. And again, you can see even number six and number seven, detecting changes in the patient condition, early recognition of sepsis across the continuum. Again, I think very critical diagnostic diagnosis issues. And here we are, 2020, the most recent survey, and missed and delayed diagnosis is number one. Uh, you know, again, all these others clearly being important device problems and behavioral health um, and a microbial stewardship, but diagnosis remains number one on their list. Um, so why is this? Uh, number one, diagnostic errors are hard to define. As I mentioned, we would meet and try to look at cases and agree what is an error. Um, is it a shortcoming in the diagnostic process or is it just getting the wrong diagnosis? Um, uh, how, do, how do we even know when a diagnosis is right or wrong? Follow-up is often uh, uh, spotty at best. Many diagnoses resolve with whether they were right or wrong with the errors going on notice. It's elusive in terms of metrics, and that's where I think we're taking, a, I would say, a medium step forward with what we're about to unfurl today here. Uh, Dr. Donabedian uh, uh, talks about uh, immature measures for rating cases and doctors and organizations. I think that's still the case. So it'd be very hard to compare or make judgments. And the final is the five easy fixes. It's not like just putting in CPOE or computer can uh, fix diagnostic errors. Things are much uh, more complex, trickier in terms of humans making decisions and even the technical fixes, which we do need are not magic bullets. So finally, diagnostic errors do matter. I mean, we talk about the five rights of medication administration. Um, this is uh, obviously familiar territory to many of you on the call here, the patient, right patient, drug, dose, time, and route. But if you don't have the right diagnosis, uh, the treatment is likely not right. So if you made the wrong diagnosis, you can do all these other things correctly and you're still uh, potentially harming the patient and making a very serious error. So coming to the, the survey instrument today, uh, I remember the first time someone told me that one of these surveys was an instrument. I, I didn't quite understand what they meant, but once you begin to sort of get your head around it, there's something like a ruler up there measuring the crayon or the size of a, ruler, of a pencil in centimeters or inches, um, or a scale that can measure somebody's weight or a temperature a thermometer that measures someone's temperature or pressure gauge. Um, and of course, that more pre precise way of measuring uh, size uh, in the upper right. Uh, this this is what this instrument is you're going to hear today, is to be able to measure something that previously you could say was sort of unmeasurable, intangible in organizations. This this quality of uh, really whether it's safe to work there, whether people feel safe, whether the processes are safe, and, uh, and, and creating these questions sort of is, a, is an effort to try to begin to measure it. And uh, so it, I would emphasize self-measurement is the key, not Big brother coming in and looking over people's shoulders, but really a guiding light or a beacon to see in the dark. Uh, and it's not a metric to be game, but really a mirror to see how we're doing and monitoring our progress. And again, here's a quote from uh, uh, Donna Beatty. When I walk into an organization and, and see workers measuring themselves, I see quality. So seeing people use these instruments to measure their own progress as well as how the patients are doing. That's the idea of a measurement tool. So what are, what are the ARC uh, surveys? Uh, we, we have safety culture surveys, really a two, direct, two decade track record of uh, validated self-assessment. There's a creative combining, and you'll see that in the questions you'll about to uh, go over, of specific processes. You know, our test results followed up, 
type questions and overall safety climate climate, which I think is so critical to be measuring here. And this is the goal of this uh, last slide. So these supplemental items, we, we had discussions, as I mentioned, over many months trying to uh, uh, come up with these questions, a lot of disagreement, a lot of breakthrough insights and compromises among people who I think I respect, hopefully you'll respect, who are, you know, we actually work on the front lines, think about these problems. And I guess the thing I would say finally is these weren't easy to draft. These were uh, um, uh, imperfect. Uh, a lot of, uh, even we went back several rounds after we drafted these questions to try to refine them. But what they do, I can safely say, represent is this best state of the art consensus at this point, and you're about to hear about them. So uh, I guess I'm turning this over to Naomi, is that right? Uh, you'll take the, the baton here and uh, um, hopefully we'll have some good Q&A around some of these ideas that we've just put up. Thank you, Gordy. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna discuss the development of the diagnostic safety supplemental items. I'll share results from a pilot study and provide some resources that are currently available. Next slide. Uh, the diagnostic safety items were designed to be added to the SOPS Medical Office Survey, and the aims of these item sets are threefold, to raise awareness about diagnostic safety with providers and staff, assess the extent to which the organizational culture supports the diagnostic process and accurate diagnoses, and to help identify processes that need improvement and sources of error in diagnosis within medical offices. We followed the same survey development process we use for all the SOP surveys. So first we reviewed the literature on diagnostic safety and searched for any existing surveys. We also identified a technical expert panel that helped guide development throughout the process. We interviewed diagnostic safety experts and talked with frontline providers and staff to help us identify key areas of importance that needed to be assessed. And then from these areas, we developed draft survey items and cognitively tested them over four rounds with um, a total of 34 medical office providers and staff. Now, after each of the four rounds, the items were revised based on the feedback and then tested again. So we obtained feedback on the survey items from our diagnostic safety TEP as well as our general SOPS TEP over the course of the development. And last fall, we conducted a pilot study of the draft items and conducted psychometric analyses to ensure the items are reliable and valid before releasing them. And then also before we finalize the item, we did one last consultation with the TEP and then release them in the spring. Our diagnostic safety TEP included Kelly Gleason, Mark Graber, David Newman Toker, Gordy Schiff, uh, and Hardeep Singh. Since the items are intended to be added towards the end of the SOPS Medical Office Survey, uh, this slide just shows the 10 patient safety culture areas or composite measures that are assessed on that survey. The survey includes survey items on communication, leadership support, teamwork, and work pressure and pace. The survey also asks about information exchange with other settings and patient safety and quality. So after completing the SOPS Medical Office Survey, providers and staff then answered the questions on the diagnostic safety. And those are organized into three composite measures. Time availability, which assesses the extent to which there's enough time available for providers to evaluate patients presenting problems, review patient information, and finish patient notes by the end of their day. Testing and referrals assesses the extent to which tests, referrals, and other diagnostic pro procedures are tracked and followed up on, whether those results are communicated to patients, and if staff confirm whether patients went to um, appointments. And then provider and staff communication around diagnosis assesses the extent to which staff are encouraged to share their concerns about a patient's health condition, and whether providers discuss um, uh, document differential diagnosis and discuss diagnostic issues with each other, including misdiagnoses. So these three areas uh, are meant to be unique aspects of culture not already assessed by the SOP survey. We conducted a pilot, pilot study of the items within medical offices, 
And the goals of the pilot study were to test the supplemental items in medical offices to conduct psychometric analysis. And part of that is to examine again, the reliability and construct validity of the items and make sure we're only keeping the best items. The pilot study was conducted via web in September to November last year. We went out to 66 medical offices and got responses from 812 providers and staff out of just over 1800 surveys administered. Uh, we had a response rate of 44% and on average, there was 12 respondents per medical office. It did range from 3 to 64 respondents. The participating um, medical offices uh, were primarily 79% were owned by a hospital or health system, university or academic medical center. Of, of the medical offices, 65% were single specialty offices. And of the single specialty offices, 56% uh, were primary care, internal medicine, family medicine, um, family practice. Uh, and the other specialties might have been things like cardiology, dermatology, orthopedics. Um, and then 48% had uh, four to nine physicians, PAs or NPs working on average per week. One part of our psychometric analysis is to examine the percent positive scores of the items, and that was to ensure if there was enough variability across medical offices. A percent positive score is basically the, the percentage of respondents answering the two most positive response options. For example, agree or strongly agree. So in the item shown here, when this office doesn't receive a patient's test results, staff follow up. The percent positive score is simply the percentage of respondents within an office who selected agree or strongly agree. And that percentage does not include anybody who selected the does not apply or don't know response option or who left the item blank. And we calculated these scores for each medical office and then averaged across the medical offices to get the average percent positive score. Next slide. So the composite measure results are ordered from the highest to the lowest and what we see, and then we also include this composite measure average, which is the average of three composite measure scores. Testing and referral had the highest at 79%, followed by provider and staff communication around diagnosis at 65% and time availability at 56%. So drilling down to the items within testing and referrals, we see they range from 84% positive to a low of 68% positive. The highest item asked about whether test results are communicated to patients, even if they're normal. Um, this is followed by an item on whether the office is effective at tracking uh, patients test results at 83%. And then the item about if the office doesn't receive a patient's test results, do staff follow up? was at 79%. And finally, the lowest item in this composite measure was when the office makes a high priority referral, do staff try to confirm if the patient went to the appointment? And that was at 68%. Provider and staff communication around diagnosis had five items ranging from 86% to 53%. And we see here that the first two items are more positive than the last three. So the highest item at 86% asked about if the provider talked directly to specialists, radiologists, pathologists when something needed clarification. This was followed by the item on if providers encourage staff to share their concern about a patient's health condition at 74%. The next three items all range from 53 to 57%. And so they're a little lower as we see here, and they ask about whether providers document differential diagnoses, talk to provider if they believe that provider may have missed a diagnosis, and if providers and staff are informed about any missed, wrong, or delayed diagnosis that happens in the medical office. Okay, so one of the things that we did as we reviewed the items is we flagged any item that had more than 30% of people answering does not apply, don't know, or was blank. And so we see here that's represented with the NADKMI. So three items had higher or uh, percentages over 30% for the NADKMI, ranging from 43% to 49%. So we wanted to see what was going on with these items, and we investigated a little further, and we noticed that most providers, that is physicians, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, were able to answer these questions. 
However, non-provider staff accounted for most of the ones answering this does not apply or don't know. So this finding could indicate room for improvement and communication with non-provider staff um, on topics for these items. For example, do providers document differential diagnosis? Are you communicating about misdiagnosis within the office? The final composite measure was time availability, and we see this had three items ranging from 61% to 48%. The first two items were close at 61 and 60% positive, and these items address if providers have enough time to re uh, review the relevant information and if the amount of time for appointments is long enough to fully evaluate patients presenting problems. And the last question, uh, which is a little lower, 48% positive, indicates that on average, less than half of respondents indicate that providers finish their patient notes by the end of the regular workday. So on the survey, there are, is also a space for open-ended comments. And of the 812 respondents, 107, or about 13%, submitted an open-ended comment. And so we reviewed them and coded them to identify themes. And I'm just going to provide a few sample quotes to help tell a story of issues within medical offices that relate to diagnostic safety. So these two quotes are um, regarding testing and referrals. It is difficult to stay on top of all the open orders, labs and imaging, referrals and faxes we should be receiving. It would be nice to have a more standardized workflow to close these gaps. I know in my field, I never have time to check the status on pending referrals, and that is frustrating. Our next quote uh, is a sample for time availability. For patients to receive the best possible care, there needs to be a complete team with a provider, nurse, and CMA so that a sufficient amount of time can be spent with the patient to make them feel that they have been thoroughly taken care of. And not all of our comments were negative, so here's a sample positive comment for provider and staff communication around diagnosis. The manager and providers are all approachable with questions or concerns. I'm not afraid to ask questions if I have a concern regarding a patient. As mentioned, we performed other psychometric analyses to examine the reliability and construct validity of the items. So I'll just run through this pretty quickly. We looked at the internal consistency reliability, which indicates how consistently respondents are answering a set of composite measure items. And so um, this was measured through Chromevax Alpha and they were all acceptable or above 0.7. We also conducted confirmatory factor analysis to assess how well the items in the composite measures fit the data, and the factor analysis results showed a good fit. Finally, we examined the correlations between these composite measures and that for the SOPS Medical Office survey. We wanted to make sure they were related, as they're all pertaining to culture, but also that they're assessing unique aspects of culture, so they're not too related. So most of the correlations between the diagnostic safety composite measures and the SOPS Medical Office survey measures were positively and significantly correlated with medium correlations showing a relationship, yet they were assessing unique aspects of culture. All right, so the results from the 2020 pilot study are available on the ARC website. And in addition, we are accepting data on the diagnostic safety items during data submission for the SOPS Medical Office survey database. And that's really coming up. Um, before we know it, it's September 1st through October 20th of this year. So we are gonna accept data from the SOPS Medical Office Survey with diagnostic supplemental items and or uh, value and efficiency supplemental items. So just the value and efficiency items assess the extent to which the organization places a priority on and promotes efficiency and waste reduction, patient-centeredness, and high quality care. So if you've already administered the Medical Office Survey, um, we are accepting data that has been administered all the way back to November of 2019, and we will accept data that is administered all the way through the close of data submission. If you haven't administered the survey yet, there is there really is still time. Um, so you can administer the survey with or without supplemental items and submit to the database. Uh, we are here to help, so we encourage you to submit and reach out with any questions your organization may have. Um, I will say if you decide that you want to administer the medical office survey and both sets of supplemental items, uh, we ask you to put them in the order of the SOPS medical office survey followed by the diagnostic safety supplemental items 
and then the value and efficiency items. If you do plan to administer, a few things to keep in mind. Um, you're going to add the items toward the end of the SUPS Medical Office Survey, so not at the very end. So right before the background questions, you'll put the supplemental items there, and then you'll add the background questions after the supplemental items. Um, also, they should be administered without modification or deletions, and that is because they're tested in a standardized manner, and we want to keep it consistent across medical offices for comparison so they can all be in the database. So, in addition to the item set, which is available in English and Spanish, um, and the pilot study results that are uh, on the ARC website, there are a few other resources I'll share today. So, um, there is a data entry and analysis tool. It's a Microsoft Excel document that has macros in it that enable you to just basically enter your individual uh, level survey results, survey data, sorry, and then the tool automatically calculates your scores and places them in charts and graphs. So if you're interested in this tool, you can email our technical assistance line or, or call us to request the tool and I'll share that information in just a few slides. ARC also provides a resource list that links to online tools and materials to help medical offices who want to improve on diagnostic safety. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list, but it does provide a nice list of an initial guidance for those seeking information about initiatives related to diagnostic safety. Um, we have or, um, sorted them by the composite measures. So, for example, if you administer the diagnostic safety um, supplemental items and you scored low on time availability, you can go directly to that section and look for resources to help improve on time availability. We also have an action planning tool that enables medical offices or really any site to document your action plans and it provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to implement initiatives and assess change. Um, this tool is applicable to all the SOP surveys and supplemental items. In addition, there's a searchable bibliography that references research materials that have used the SOP surveys. So you can see how other people are using it. You can search by healthcare setting, uh, or by specific topics, such as um, those who've linked the SOP survey data to other outcome measures or who looked at culture and made improvements over time. So, as I mentioned, please feel free to contact us with any questions you may have. We're really here to help, um, and it, whether it be about the survey or administration or other resources that are available. Our email address is safetyculturesurveys at westat.com or databases on safetyculture at westat.com. Our general TA phone number is 1-888-324-9749 and our database TA phone is 1-888-324-9790. You can also get this contact information and the resources on the ARC website which is at www.ahrq.gov backslash SOPS. We also send out announcements through the SOPS email updates and they might notify, um, notify you about updates to the SOPS products, um, data submission timelines or events like this one, uh, webcasts. So you can sign up for these email updates by going to the top right corner of the ARC website and choosing email updates and check the um, surveys on patient safety culture. So now I'm gonna turn it back to Joanne to facilitate some question and answers. Great, thank you. Um, thanks Naomi and Gordy and Karen. I think we shared a lot of information um, over these past few minutes. So um, as a reminder, I uh, just want to let everybody know you can ask a question through the Q&A feature shown here. And depending on your browser, the screen could look a little different, but look for the Q&A icon at the bottom right hand side of your screen. And be sure that the drop down option displays all panelists and then our team will be able to see your question. So we encourage you again to share your name or your organization or your role when you type your question. Um, so let's see what kinds of questions we have so far. Um, 
So we did get some questions during the presentations and um, I'll just call you out um, if uh, it looks like the question was directed to you and then if somebody else wants to chime in, please feel free to do so. Uh, I think the first question is probably for Naomi um, and it's from Mina Andy. Is this diagnostic survey mandatory for practices that do the medical office survey? Thanks for asking. No, it is not mandatory. The supplemental items are um, either one, the value and efficiency or the diagnostic safety is completely optional if you're doing the SOPS medical office survey. Okay, great. Um, this next question is for Gordy and it's from David Newman Toker. Uh, Gordy, do we know anything about how often the wrong diagnosis is combined with the wrong treatment to yield the correct or lucky treatment for the disease the patient actually has? Um, thank you, David, who is a recent past president of a Society for Improving Diagnosis in Medicine and helped us put this together. Um, uh, so, you know, the question is, what's the relationship between getting the, the wrong diagnosis and giving the wrong treatment? And, you know, does sometimes, you, you know, it overlaps anyway, right? And does it really matter? Um, and I don't think we have much data on that. I, I think we can all think of examples where the, the, the wrong treatment either could, you know, kill two birds with one stone. Maybe there's two diseases that you give steroids to and the patient feels better even if you have the wrong diagnosis. Um, although I think what we really worry about is where the wrong treatment really is dramatically different. So let's talk about dissecting aortic aneurysm versus a myocardial infarction. Um, you know, you treat myocardial infarction with thrombolytics and, and, and blood thinners, and that's gonna make the dissecting aneurysm or leaking dissecting aneurysm bleed more. So there's, there's some things where it's really critical. It would be nice to have that list where you could really know exactly the, the critical pitfalls where it really matters the most. Of course, treating a viral URI with an antibiotic is probably one of the most common misdiagnosis and mistreatment. Um, you know, fortunately, I, I guess most patients are not harmed, but we now know antibiotics are losing their, their efficacy, growing resistance. Um, interesting, even like a, a very drug like chloramphenicol that caused bone marrow, you know, aplastic anemia. Most of the patients that got that were getting it for a viral URI, so no treatment. So. This is clearly important to think about this relationship between treatment and diagnosis and and work to get it better and right more often. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question looks like it's for Naomi. Um, it's from Paula Griswold. Are there any survey questions about communication with patients for the diagnostic process aside from follow up of referrals or tests? For example, are patients invited to comment if they feel there are symptoms or questions that weren't discussed or facts that don't fit into the working diagnosis? That's a great question. So, um, in our initial draft, we did have items about communicating with the patient and how the patient is interpreting things or if they were invited, you know, to ask a, a follow up questions, if there was time available for that. And, and what we found is that. They weren't the best, like providers and staff weren't the best person to ask for that. Providers um, uh, would say yes, always, you know, we always do this, strongly agree. It was very little variability. They felt like they were doing a great job um, on making sure people understood it. And so we ended up dropping those types of items just because there was very little variability and we felt like uh, providers and staff may not be the best to assess that. All right, thank you. Uh, next question is for Gordy from Mina Andy. Who's expected to inform the providers about missed, wrong, or delayed diagnoses? There was a question on the survey um, uh, that sort of implied that that's expected, but who, who communicates to the providers about those uh, missed and delayed and incorrect diagnoses? Yeah, well, that's, that's a key question. And um, I, I think, there should be a multiple streams of, of having that kind of feedback. And in many cases, those streams are, are dry right now. Those feedback loops are missing. 
So, um, you know, one would hope at least to the extent that people in the office have a culture where people feel it's safe for questioning a diagnosis. Um, I send somebody out of the office and, you know, I say that they're, um, you know, having some organic a medical problem and the staff knows that they, their husband just died and they're very stressed from that. And I didn't elicit that or the patient didn't share that with me or, or they're being abused by their, their domestic partner. So the first level should be that there should be a comfort level that anybody who touches the patient who, who should be able to question a diagnosis. Um, and I, I think a, a number of these questions try to get at that kind of culture of rather than saying, I'm the doctor, no one questions me, I'm, I'm always right and never wrong. And, and diagnosis is a doctor's job. By the way, historically, it was, it was against the nursing license to make a diagnosis that, that that's a doctor's job. Well, well we, we need to radically change the culture in the, in the office uh, uh, in, in, in the way people work together in a team. But then the broader question is really sort of how do you get sort of downstream feedback? So one would be, it should be easy for people to get back and touch, reach the office. So if my patients aren't doing better, but they, they try to call me and, and the, our office is designed around, you know, keeping calls away from the doctor and you can't get through busy, sig big, busy signals. So some questions sort of directly or indirectly get at that in the main survey and in this. But uh, I think, I, I would say these are underdeveloped, these feedback loops, and we need to figure out how to optimize this in the, the simplest way is just to make it much more comfortable so people don't tell Dr. Schiff if he hears about what happened, he's going to get very upset. That that would that's sort of a very traditional and old culture, but very antithetical to the kind of culture we're trying to measure and create here, and um, and, uh, and and really make people at all levels feel comfortable with with these questions. And you can see that. In, in the survey results that were presented, there's, there's room for improvement. So we, we want to up the ante there. Uh, much more to say about that if, if you want to ask other questions, but it's getting, getting this feedback loop and learning and hearing and creating a culture of sharing is, is exactly what we try to get at with these questions. I, I fear we, 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 we grasped uh, to do it more perfectly than we did, but you know, this is uh, our best shot. First round of these questions. Yeah, yeah. thanks. I, I like how you're saying we're trying to up the ante, and I think that's right, right? Some of these questions are are kind of pushing the envelope in terms of where the culture should be rather than maybe where it typically is in medical offices. Um, the next question is from Yan Ling Yu from Washington Advocates for Patient Safety. Um, and I think this is a question for Naomi. In the SOPS medical office survey, do you have a question on whether providers have enough time to listen to patients about their medical history and communicate uh, about the diagnosis? Effective communication with patients is obviously a critical step for accurate diagnosis. Yeah, thank you. I think um, there isn't a specific question about having enough time to listen to the patients. Um, there are a list of patient safety and quality issues that talk about whether the, it was documented and you can find it in the patient's medical record. Um, but again, I think what we were finding is it's, um, it's hard to self assess how well um, you're doing at being an effective communicator. So, you know, you might think you're a great communicator and, uh, and really it's hard to know. Um, and so I, I think the patient is probably better asking um, that question. And so we don't have something specific to that. But, but I, I would say we've broken some new ground here by explicitly calling out having enough time in this mm -hmm. supplement. And so, you know, as I said, this, this isn't perfect and it's it maybe not great, but I think it is great that we've opened the door to saying, um, Time really matters to be able to do a lot of the work of diagnosis and we've tried to craft these two or three questions in that that, that section to really get at that and allow people to express that. Uh, uh, you know, people do surveys and say, well, doctors have as much time as they ever did, maybe even longer the length of visits. But when we consider everything we have to do and 
and to work in a time of diagnosis, including explaining to diagnosis to patients. Uh, we, we know that that's that's a, a critical and stressful issue, and, and hopefully these questions can get at that. Yeah, and just to add add to that, um, the surveys on patient safety culture again are surveys of providers and staff. But Karen, I don't know if you want to chime in um, as the director of both the SOP surveys and the CAPS patient experience surveys. Certainly, CAPS uh, surveys will ask about um, you know whether patient get the patient's perspective on whether the providers communicated um, in a way and explained things in a way they could understand and um, spent enough time with them, et cetera. Yes, uh, thanks for the opportunity to explain that. That's right, the consumer assessment of healthcare providers and systems uh, suite of surveys are uh, asked patients about their experiences, not their satisfaction, but their experiences in healthcare setting. Uh, did something happen? How often did something happen? Uh, and we spend a lot of time asking questions about communication. Uh, and the communication questions are really the questions that patients can address. Uh, you know, did they, the providers explain things in a way that you could understand? That's a question for a patient. And so the CAPS questions are questions that for which the patient is the best or sometimes the only source of that information. And we have many surveys, uh, the CAPS suite of surveys and the SOP suite of surveys uh, share settings. So we have a clinician and group survey that you can use in a medical office, for example, or, you know, there's a, certainly, uh, I would imagine you're familiar with the HCAP survey, which, you know, uh, asks questions about communication uh, and uh, for the same setting that the HSOP survey asks questions for, and it's entirely possible to uh, go back and forth between those two surveys to analyze data uh, um, concordantly to understand, you know, to, to get that additional information on communication. Great, thank you. Um, next question looks like it's for Naomi from Gretchen Ratzlaff. Do you recommend that we include the diagnostic question set in our specialty clinics? We do not have any family practice clinics, only specialty. Yeah, thank you. What was one of the things we wanted to make sure it was applicable in specialty clinics? So, um, during our COG interviewing to test the items, we made sure we talked to people from um, different specialties to make sure the items were working for them. And then when we were recruiting medical offices to participate, we also included special, just single specialty, like, like cardiology, dermatology. We did have those clinics involved. Um, and so, yes, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, you could use those items within your specialty clinics. And, and we wanted to convey a message. First of all, number one, that they're generic enough questions that they did apply broadly. And that these, these are things that are important for specialists, you know, an orthopedic doctor or a more medical specialty is not too important to be following up on test results or to be, um, learning about their mistakes and talking about them in the office. So this is this really, these are broad um, issues that, that really everybody really needs to uh, be aware of and really frankly change the kind of way that they practice. Great, um, I have another question here and I think it's both uh, Naomi can weigh in and Gordy. The question's from Joanne Locke from Crico. Any thoughts on whether the survey will be able to measure the effect of virtual visits on various aspects of diagnostic safety? And I know, Naomi, um, the pilot study for this diagnostic safety item set was conducted in the fall of 2020. So in the midst of the pandemic, I wonder if you have any comment on, um, again, whether the survey can measure the effect of virtual visits on various aspects of diagnostic safety. So, yeah. So, um... I feel like there, and I'm not remembering right now, but I do feel like we had a, a question we asked participating medical offices if they were doing all virtual visits or the extent to which. Um, and, and so we haven't done further analysis looking at links between that. Um, and, uh, but I do think that uh, you can use these, they're general enough to look at linking virtual visits and uh, 
diagnostic safety. And I'll turn it over to Gordy to say if he has anything more to add. Um, yeah, I, I guess my first reaction is probably not with precision, right? That we haven't precisely tried to see the difference before and after. Of course, one of the things that will be of interest to see how um, those people who have been doing these surveys over time serially, what changed during 2020. Um, so uh, I, I think we're just trying to figure out what, what, what is a virtual visit? What, what is a better communication? What is uh, taking enough time with the patient mean uh, in a virtual versus an you know, in-person visit? So, but, but, but I would say that uh, again, they are broad enough to at least get at these qualities with these visits. I don't think they're, there's the precision to really um, delve into some of the harder questions that I think we all have about virtual visits. We just wrote something in the uh, um, American Journal of Medicine about some of the issues with diagnosis and virtual visits. Mark Graber has written some material for ARC that's published on the ARC website. So uh, as we try to really get and of course, we now don't even know to what extent we, virtual visits will will be, what percentage of visits will remain virtually versus change back to in person. So I think we're, we're this is still a work in progress, and and this survey doesn't really precisely get at that. All right. Um, the next, uh, I'm going to combine a couple of questions here for you, Karen. Is there a plan to create a similar diagnostic item set for hospitals, nursing homes, or ambulatory surgery centers? So that's a great question. And uh, what I'm going to throw it back at you and say, why don't the questioners write to us on our technical assistance line and tell us why the existing item set doesn't work in the settings that you're interested in and what additional questions you have and let us know about the concerns that you have and, and the specific issues you would like us to measure in a survey and so that we understand you know what the concerns are and why a tool is necessary and uh, we'd really like to hear from you you can always contact us uh, through technical assistance if you want to write it directly to me just put my name in the in the subject line, uh, but you know, and, and I'll get the message, but tell us why this is important to you so that we can consider it. You know, we always try to be responsive to the users of our tools and uh, our surveys and other tools. And, and, and uh, I'd like to know what's on your mind. So this is a great way for us to get feedback about what's important. And then, you know, we'll certainly add it to the list of things that we're gonna seriously consider and discuss, let us know. Um, and, it, and it wasn't super clear from the question, but in case the, um, the the person who was asking wanted to know, there are existing surveys on patient safety culture for each of those settings. Um, we just don't have a specific diagnostic safety item set for those settings or that has been tested in that's, those settings. That's, what, that's how I interpreted that question to ask about the item set. And that's right, we do have surveys for those settings. Uh, and another question for you, Karen, is there a plan for ARC to develop a patient experience survey on diagno the diagnostic process, safety culture, or error, medical error? Again, um, uh, tell, write to us, and you can get to me through that, that soft technical assistance line and tell me what your concerns are. Uh, this is a really good time right now to uh, to let me in, in our, our planning and thinking about the future for both programs, CAPS and SOFT, to let us know what, you know, what your interests are and why it's an issue to you and what kinds of things you'd like to see measured. Please provide me with that background information. All right, great. Well, we are at the end of yeah. our time. Thank you very much, uh, Gordy Schiff, Naomi Yant, Karen Ginsberg. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to email the technical assistance line surveys on patient safety culture at westat.com. A brief webcast evaluation will pop up when you close out from today's webcast. Please take a moment to give us your feedback because it helps us improve our offerings and plan future events. We invite you to visit the ARC website and contact us at any time again. Thanks again for joining us.
this concludes today's presentation.